Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Malkin Fund, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. I'm an erstwhile American historian as well, which may explain why two years ago I was invited to place a wreath on Franklin Delano Roosevelt's grave at Hyde Park on the 60th anniversary of the president's death. Well, my remarks then were respectful, indeed worshipful, but regretful too that by the first years of our new century, the lie had so clearly been given to the carefully chosen words with which I had concluded my chapter on FDR in a history of the U.S. written 50 years before. For the most part, I had prophesied, the Roosevelt Revolution had made its permanent impression upon national life, and it seemed as if Americans would never again enjoy or regret an era of laissez-faire. Well, I was wrong, of course, egregiously so. There was no permanent Roosevelt Revolution. There has been a counter-revolution instead. But now today's guest has written an absolutely brilliant new book that not only meticulously details the backwards march dominated by a vast conservative movement determined to undermine FDR's New Deal achievements, it offers hope for and points the way to a new New Deal as well. Paul Krugman writes an extraordinarily readable, provocative, and influential twice-weekly op-ed column for the New York Times. A prize-winning economist, he is professor of economics and international affairs at Princeton University as well. The Conscience of a Liberal is his hopeful new W.W. Norton book. And I would ask my guests to elaborate first on two fascinating passages from this fascinating book. First, one, and I am old enough now in the service of the New Deal to have to put on my glasses. One key passage of this book, which many readers may find uncomfortable, is that race is at the heart of what has happened to the country I grew up in. And two, simple enough, yes, Virginia, there is a vast right-wing conspiracy. That is, there is an interlocking set of institutions ultimately answering to a small group of people that collectively reward loyalists and punish dissenters. And I want to ask you, Paul Krugman, tell us more about that. Okay. Yes, Virginia, there is a, a vast right-wing conspiracy. It's not very hidden. There are think tanks, uh, media organizations, a whole set of places that supply money, that supply jobs. Look at 2006, okay, devastating Republican defeat. Two Republican senators who went down were Lincoln Chafee, who was essentially an Eisenhower Republican somehow adrift in the 21st century, a, a moderate guy, um, and Rick Santorum, who was the essence of a modern, actually was running the Kate Street machine, the, uh, the control over the lobbyists that the Republican Party tried to establish and did for several years. Um, what happened to the two of them after the election? Lincoln Chafee got a one-year teaching job at Brown. Rick Santorum got a nice, cushy think tank position heading a new program on America's enemies. So the, the, the vast right-wing conspiracy takes care of its own. It's very real. It's a, it's a huge amount of money. There are 
places to go. Uh, it, it does, in effect, and it's, it, it, you look at all of these institutions and you tend to find the same funding sources. There may be dozens, scores of, of these think tanks, of these uh, um, lobbying organizations. You find the same five families supplying a lot of the money. So it, it really is a, a cohesive movement. And an effective one, I gather. Has been extraordinarily effective. Took over the Republican Party in the 1970s. Uh, won a lot of elections, uh, ran all three branches of the U.S. government until last November. Uh, and uh, that is, in a large part, the, the story of what happened to America. It's the story of what happened to the middle-class America I grew up in. You say has been. Do you mean had been effective or...? I think it has. I mean, there's still, there's still a lot of money there. There's still a lot of organization. But... This is an optimistic book. Conscience of a Liberal is a book that comes to the conclusion at the end that, that the fundamental forces, the, the nature of American society is changing the way that is undermining this, this movement, that they, they probably have had their day. And, uh, and we are, in fact, ready for a new progressive era, a new New Deal. Not wishful thinking? Oh, I guess we'll find out in the next few years, right? Um, but. Well, look, um, race. I do. Race is central. You you ask, you know, what is what is movement conservatism? Which, by the way, is not my term. It's what they call it. Say themselves. They so they they themselves call themselves movement conservatives. There is this movement. What movement conservatism wants to achieve is the rollback of the New Deal. The way it wins elections is by exploiting other issues, hot button issues that distract people from the economic agenda. Uh, those can be national security, they can be values issues. As I say, you know, Bush won the 2004 election by promising to defend the country against gay married terrorists. Uh, but the, what they do in, in office then is, you know, they, then having won the election on that basis, the first thing he wants to do is privatize social security. Um, but the quintessential issue, the issue that has won them more than anything else is race. Uh, Ronald Reagan's career. You know, he's now been sanctified as the ultimate pure conservative, but in fact, his political career was very largely based on tacit race baiting, from the welfare queen driving her Cadillac to starting the 1980 campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where the civil rights workers were murdered with a speech on states' rights. But it's not working so well anymore because we are, first of all, a more diverse country, large Latino vote, growing Asian vote, and those people are not going to be happy with even coded race appeals. And we are a better country, just much less racist than we used to be. And I think the whole strategy is losing its force. You know, as I read the book, and I read it so thoroughly, page by page, because it is so damn well written, I kept wondering about whether there isn't an incredible optimism that you're uh, demonstrating here that uh, may lead us all down the garden path. Well, look, I think... And you're not usually that optimistic. Yeah, well, it, it is a question, right? Am I... I'm not usually big on wishful thinking. I'm usually a, um, a bit uh, doer, actually, a bit... Um, okay, why am I optimistic? Um, it's a changed country. Just take a... First, just look at things like attitudes on race. It's been so central in American politics, but... Uh, it's different. Uh, take a look at, uh, I, I think in some ways the racial issues have been more visceral than, than practical policy. What it's, do you mean? Uh, that, that in fact we have not for these past 30 years had Republicans running on a promise to restore Jim Crow. That what they're doing is instead just appealing to people's gut sense that they, they're afraid of racial diversity, that they're afraid of civil rights. Um, and that depends upon people still, the populace still having a, a strong streak of, of racism in it. And you look at then at, at my, my favorite poll, it's not a political issue at all, but, it's, uh, but I think it has political consequences. What do people think of interracial marriage? It used to be the great taboo. It was the great, uh, and as recently as the late 1970s, uh, by a large margin, the public disapproved of interracial marriage, did not think it was okay. Only about a third of the public in the late 70s thought it was acceptable to have interracial marriages. That's gone away. Now, you know, very few people, 77% approve in the last poll I've seen. So that's a change in the country. Now, I'll tell you what my concern is. I think the right-wing Republican machine is collapsing. It's falling apart. 
it doesn't have the uh, the ability to to do what it did that doesn't mean that we actually get a new new deal i mean one of the questions in 2008 first of all it's still possible that you know that that some hardline rightist will win the election one way or another but even if that doesn't happen the public may think that it's electing fdr and find out that it's actually elected grover cleveland uh, there was a real concern about whether the Democrats will actually be the progressives I hope they'll be. Your concern? Yeah, my concern as well. Sure. That's a very big... Uh, the, 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 the possibilities for dramatic change are there. We have huge public support for universal health care. We have a much more political scientists who try to collate the poll data into various indices. The, the national mood is more liberal than it has been since the, the early 1960s. But whether that translates into effective political action is another question. Now, you make a point here that, uh, economist or not, what you're claiming here is that it has been the nature of political leadership that has uh, done us in. Yeah. Is that what you're saying now, that you are so distrustful of contemporary liberal political leadership? I'm not sure whether I'm distrustful yet. Let's put it this way. I'm, um, you're gearing up to be. It could happen. Uh, look, um, the history. I, I immersed myself in long American history, conscience of a liberal, as, as you said, noticed this. Uh, I go back um, 100 years and beyond, in some cases, to try and get the shape of what's happened. And during the, the Gilded Age, which I think the, in, in economic terms, the Gilded Age lasted right up until, until the New Deal. Uh, during the Gilded Age, there were two parties, and there were real differences, but often, even when Democrats did get the White House, even when they were uh, you know, able to achieve some political success, uh, they were what they at the time called Bourbon Democrats, uh, Democrats who were basically just like the Republicans, only maybe a little less corrupt. And that's um, there are certainly Bourbon Democrats today. And what we don't know is we don't know, you know, they're, they're so take, take a, a fact, not in the book, because it's a new thing. One of the remarkable things looking right now at the early stages of, of election 2008 is that corporate giving to the Republicans has collapsed. All of a sudden, basically only the oil and gas industry is still Republican oriented. All the rest are, are giving more money to the Democrats. Um, is that good news or bad news? from a progressive liberal point of view. It does mean that the, the odds of a Democrat being elected are, are substantially higher, of a Democratic Congress are higher, but it also raises the question whether that uh, putative Democratic administration to come will be beholden to, to the same interests that, that benefit from low taxes on the rich and, and a weak social safety net. Let me ask you whether you think that any one of the now leading candidates for the Democratic nomination is likely to be um, subverted, uh, whatever word you want to use, by these corporate contributions that probably indicate they smell victory and where it's going to be. Yeah, there's a bit more to it than that, by the way. Let me just back up for a second and talk about what it, the corporations, people sometimes talk about the Bush administration as being the, the creature of the corporations. Uh, I almost say, would that it were so. Uh, to some extent, obviously, they, they, they got a lot of money from corporations, or did. They, they uh, looked out for their interests up to a point, but actually it was almost a kind of extortion racket. And they did not govern in a way that, with the, with the competence, with the kind of long-term planning that, that corporate America expects. They were... They, they tended to give big contracts not to established corporations, but to their friends who had no idea what they were doing. You know, Blackwater was not a big major corporation until the Bush administration threw a bunch of contracts its way. Um, so in some ways, corporate America is, you know, is looking for a little more stability, a little more competence than what they've gotten. Now, among the Democrats, uh, you know, times rules, I can't do endorsements. You know, clearly, what's been happening... No, I'm the, really asking you about disendorsements. Yeah, well, but I'm not even sure I can do that. Look, what we have is uh, the John Edwards of the three leading Democrat candidates, the one who's furthest back in polls, money, and everything else, has struck a clear populist agenda. There's no question that 
that he's not going to, he's not part of this, he's not a Bourbon Democrat by, by any stroke of the imagination. Barefoot uh, lawyer, right? Well, you know, look, he's personally prosperous. He's, uh, he's worked for a hedge fund, all of which I think is perfectly fine. People, we don't expect, you know, FDR was, was, a, was a wealthy individual. That didn't stop him from being a, a true uh, servant of the people. Um, but he's clearly not in that boat. Now, he has consistently through this campaign been pushing the Democratic Party in a strongly progressive direction and then has been matched. The reason why that hasn't actually translated into the progressive movement, you know, saying we'll only we'll only do this if Edwards gets it, is because he's been matched. So, in the end, uh, John Edwards comes out with a real serious uh, universal health care plan in February, and in September, Hillary Clinton comes out with a plan which I have to say is very good and actually looks a whole lot like the Edwards plan. Uh, is Hillary Clinton? What would she do in office? Don't know. I'm 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 inclined to be optimistic, but maybe that's just because you know I've I've been I've been feeling pretty chipper about the U.S. political scene these days. And our other leading candidate, Barack Obama, is a. I mean, if Kavada can say, all right, I, I don't, I, I'm not really good. I'm trying to term. get you into trouble, obviously. Yeah, no, the I'll tell you what what. What bothers me about Barack Obama, there are many excellent things. Of course, he was stunningly right on the war. Uh, he does have this rhetoric of, oh, can't we all work together and end the harsh partisanship? And of course, I worship FDR. Mm -hmm. And FDR didn't talk that way. FDR talked about the, uh, the, the, uh, the evil forces of, of wealth uh, and the, the advocates of war. And they hate me as they have never hated anybody else. And I welcome their hatred. I, I want to hear a little bit more Rooseveltian rhetoric. I worry a little bit that that uh, that Obama wants to be too nice, and that's not that's not going to work. You, we still have. I mean, I'm I'm feeling very optimistic now. We've had this really, from my point of view, out of control right wing movement that came very close to establishing a long term lock on power in this country. And if you want to uh, you want to take these people on, you better be prepared to to be harsh and partisan, not in the interests of partisanship for its own sake, but because there are real issues at stake. It's interesting to me that and, and certainly it comes out in the book, uh, that you you do feel that there has been a sea change in attitudes among Americans. We're not now talking about the shift from the New Deal to what we've experienced in the past 20, 30 years. But you do feel there is a, that the better angels of our nature have surfaced. Yes, uh, I'm a big Lincoln fan too. Uh, no, the, I think it has. Look, the, it, we went through a, a very bad period these, these past uh, six years. We went through a period when it was easy to believe that we were going to go into a new McCarthy era that we were going to be in a situation where fear would be would allow uh, the bad people to dominate our political scene. Um, and for a while it seemed that that was where we were going, but we didn't. Uh, in, in the end, it turned out that the, the, the American people are better than that. And then you look at attitudes, polling, but also voting on issues of domestic policy, social, uh, look at the fight now over SCHIP, the, the Children's Health Insurance Program. Uh, there, I think there would have been a time uh, in, the, in, in the early Reagan years when a lot of people would have, a lot of Americans would have disapproved of something that might help people poorer than, than themselves. There was a period when there was a lot of hostility. Any, any government aid was, well, it's going to give money to, the, to, the, to welfare cheats. And that's not the public attitude now. I mean, there's some of it, obviously. There are some people, but, but we have overwhelming public support for the idea that children should be entitled to health care. By the time this program is on the air, we may have found that the president's veto was sustained. Yeah, because the... House of Representatives, uh, although it has a substantial Democratic majority, still has enough, you know, it's more than a third Republican, and there's still a lot of party discipline. There, uh, Republican party discipline. Republican discipline. party discipline, although actually Democratic party discipline is getting better. As, uh, as of we're taping, there were, I think, eight Democrats who did not vote in favor of the, of the S-chip bill, and five of them have been persuaded to 
vote to override the veto. So well. it's actually the, we're, we're see, but sure. Uh, but you know, give, this is, there's a shock factor. I don't think Republicans have quite absorbed what's happened to them. I mean, just two years ago, everybody, I have a whole shelf of books about the permanent Republican majority. You know, Red America, we're going to, they're, they're going to, and I don't think that they've quite absorbed the fact that uh, actually that's not the way it's going. And, and some of them are still being good movement men. And I don't think uh, uh, that's going to be hard to, to deal with. It's interesting to me that at no point do you talk about uh, national security and its impact. I did a lot of work for this book trying to figure out, because there's a legend, right? The story is that ever since Vietnam, the Democrats have been perceived as weak on national security, and that's been a big political liability. Um, in, in effect, the argument, and it's almost this blatant, that, that, uh, that the Democrats have never recovered from having, in the end, been right about Vietnam that you get punished forever for having been right about Vietnam. And, and there's almost an attitude among some people still in Democrats in, in Washington that, well, we better not make that mistake again. We better make sure that we, we're wrong about Iraq to, to stay credible on national security. Um, the reality is that if you look at the years immediately following Vietnam, the public did not perceive the Democrats as weak on national security that they were not punished, that even the 1972 election in which George McGovern was shattered, it was McGovern who was shattered, not the Democrats in general. They did okay in the general election. Uh, the, the picture of Democrats as weak on national security, the idea that we were stabbed in the back in Vietnam is something that was created retroactively uh, in the 1980s. I call it the rambification of history. Um, and beyond that, there have actually been relatively few elections in which national security was a big factor. And I would say really only two, 2002 and 2004. Those two post 9-11 elections are aberrations. And now that the Bushies have proved themselves so unable to wage war, now that they've made such a mess of things, I think that issue is off the table, at least for a while. And you think that um, it's gone now? Not entirely. Well, you right. don't factor it into uh, the new New Deal. Not for a while, at least. I think I think that f we have at least um, at least five years and maybe more before the ramification of Iraq. Eventually, I'm sure. Eventually, there will be movies about how some heroic guy with bulging muscles could have won the war if only those politicians hadn't stopped him. But I think right now, the American public is sick of this war. Uh, and the American public has, cap has caught on to the fact that, that these, these guys on the right are not, for all the, the flag waving, are not actually very good at, at securing the nation. Given your assumptions about your optimism, let me call it yeah. that, never mind assumptions about this or that, what is it you think that th the good new world, the brave new world before us is going to mean in terms of our economic situation? Well, first of all, I do, I believe, better than 50% odds that we will have universal health care by the end of the, the next administration. That in itself, just right by itself, means a huge improvement in the quality of life for not just for those who are currently uninsured, but for anybody who is worried about losing health insurance. This is a huge source of anxiety that Americans face that citizens of no other advanced country face. And we can solve that. And we can solve it actually, uh, we can actually save money in the process of eliminating that anxiety. So I think we're going to have a huge improvement on that dimension. Uh, will we do a lot to reduce inequality, to share the fruits of economic progress more broadly? I think we can. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a harder hill to climb than, than universal health insurance, which we know how to do it and we know it can be, can be done right away. But um, I do think that we'll get a lot of progress. It's not, you know, the, the, uh, the great leveling of incomes, the creation of a middle class society that FDR accomplished was made possible by exceptional and extreme circumstances. The Great Depression, which totally discredited 
laissez-faire. Uh, the uh, World War II, which established a period of government controls that were used in effect to create a more equitable wage structure that that persisted. I'm not expecting or hoping for anything like that this time around, so it's not so easy to make big changes, but I think we could emerge five years from now as a more equal, less stressed society than we are at present. Will our continuing involvement in globalization push us closer to that or further away? Oh, globalization is, let's be frank, globalization is an unequalizing force. Right? When you uh, import lots of labor-intensive products from China, you are reducing the demand for less skilled labor in the United States. And it is, that's Economics 101. It's in the textbook. I, I wrote the textbook, so I know that. Um, the, uh, but it's not as big a force as some people would, would have you believe. And the way you can tell that is those same forces of globalization are acting on all advanced countries. And yet, this spectacular growth in inequality, this return to a, a second gilded age, that's a uniquely American phenomenon. I mean, it's not even that you know, France is different or Sweden is different. Canada is different. Uh, the, we, we say as, we talk as if globalization dooms the union movement. But Canada still has as many workers unionized as it did in the 1960s. So am I fair and sane in the 30 seconds we have left that when you say it's politics, it's political leadership, you incorporate this area too? Oh, very much so. But I'm not, not, I'm not a protectionist. That's not, I, I don't think it's necessary. You can still have a decent society with relatively open markets to world trade, as every other advanced country is proving. And you think we'll prove that too? Uh, I think it's more likely than not. I think, I think we hedging. will get there. I, no, I'm not wildly optimistic. I realize that there are ways this can go wrong, but I think we will. I hope you're right, and thank you very much for joining me today on The Open Mind, and I hope that everybody reads The Conscience of a Liberal. Well, thanks. thank you. I thank you very much. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time, and for transcripts of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Malkin Fund, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.